One of the things that's really handy for technicians and installers and anybody who does what we do is when you don't get terms mixed up. So when we say words like power, I, I'm measuring power. I've got power. Power, power, wonder work and power. It's a great song. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? It really is. It really is. Um, it, it, it really doesn't mean anything specific electrically. So that could mean that you're measuring voltage. That could mean that you're measuring current. So let's, today we're talking about current. So let's anchor down what is current? What does it mean electrically? Somebody, give me something. Current. Flow? All right. Movement? And this isn't like, this is really neither here nor there as far as importance, but we imagine that these electrons are flowing through a wire like water through a pipe, right? And that's not what's happening because electrons are actually these tiny, 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 tiny things. Uh, and we're dealing with alternating current, meaning that it's moving back and forth. So they're barely moving at all. These electrons are not traveling down the line. Really, the easiest way to think of it is like, it's really kind of like a force field. So when a, a, a charging um, or ele electric, uh, electromagnetic charge actually travels down the outside of a wire and it moves these electrons a very, very small distance. Because with alternating current, it's going positive, it's going negative, they're just moving back and forth. And so when we're measuring with an amp clamp, when we're measuring current, what are we actually measuring? Anyone know? What is the, what is the magical thing that we're measuring when we put this amp clamp over a wire? Not speed. The speed of electrons actually stays the same. What are we, what are we measuring? Magnetic. We're measuring a magnetic field. We're measuring an electromagnetic field. Okay, so around that wire, there's this field that occurs. And the field, and I heard this recently um, on a, another YouTube video, the easiest way to think about it is this field acts like shepherds that move the, the little electron sheet back and forth through the wire. So it's actually the field that really is doing the work. That's that initial field. Initially, when you energize a circuit, this field appears, and this is measuring the field. And what we need to know is, is that the more current that's moving, the more, uh, the more electrons that are moving, the more force um, that's moving through that, through that conductor, the more there's going to be a field. Now, I even just said it. I just said force. And voltage is what we think of as the pressure. So if you measure water pressure, and we give a lot of analogies here. We say it's kind of like this or it's like that. It probably really isn't like that at all. But in our heads, we build this little cartoon so we can understand what we're doing. And voltage really is like water pressure. So if you were to go up to your house and use a little pressure gauge and measure the water pressure at the house, you could measure pressure even if there's no flow, right? You could take a gauge, you could hook it up to a faucet, you could open it up. There could not be any flow in the entire house and you'd still measure pressure, right? In the same way that if I take a voltmeter and I hook it up to an outlet on the wall, I take the two probes, I stick it in the outlet, I'll measure 120 volts, right? Does that mean that there's any work actually getting done in that outlet? Anything's happening? No, it's just measuring pressure. Because if that were the case, there'd be electricity dumping out of an outlet all over the floor, and that'd make a big electricity mess. There'd be a big puddle of electricity laying on the floor. We all know that's not how that works. So it's an open circuit. We're measuring pressure. And when I measure current, do I have to, does there have to be flow or work occurring in order for me to measure current? The answer is yes. If I took this clamp and I stuck it around the wire that's feeding that outlet right now, it wouldn't matter what the voltage is. It could be a million volts. But if the circuit is open, I'm going to measure nothing. Right? So there's actually not this field that's occurring, or at least not to the same extent, that this meter is going to pick up. So that field isn't moving electrons through that conductor. But what I really want to talk about is more specific. So that's just, that's just theory stuff there. So we understand what we're measuring when we measure current. We're actually measuring something happening. The electrons are actually moving. They're doing some work, right? And so very simply, let's talk about Ohm's law. And I'm not even, I'm not even going to draw Ohm's law up here. If you want to learn more about Ohm's Law, you want to learn the formula, go ahead and look it up in the tech tip email, look it up in the app, whatever. It's E equals I times R. But very simply, you don't even need to know that. You don't need to, need to know how to do math at all as a technician because you're almost never going to do the math. But here's where it gets really handy. If I reduce the resistance to the movement of electrons, so there's less resistance, meaning electrons can move easier. Does that make sense? There's less resistance, electrons can move easier. Will more or less of them move? More. more will move. Less resistance means more electrons will move. Everybody buy that? If I have higher resistance, so there's more force against the motion of electrons, will more or less electrons move? Less electrons will move, right? Very simple. So if you are measuring a current, 
that is higher than it's supposed to be. You put a clamp around a wire and you're measuring a current that's higher than it's supposed to be and the voltage stays the same because here's a reality in most of what we do, the voltage stays the same. It doesn't change a whole lot. You can get some voltage drops that can cause low current and some things, but generally speaking, when you go to a residential house, what is the voltage applied to the air conditioner in a residential house? 240 volts, thereabouts, right? Now, is it worth checking? Sure, make sure it's not doing something crazy. Now, as a quick side note, when do you measure voltage? Do you measure voltage with the equipment off or do you measure voltage with the equipment on? You measure voltage with the equipment on, right? Because the voltage very well might be correct if the equipment is off because if it's not doing any work, there's not gonna be any voltage drop. Voltage drop doesn't show up until the equipment is on, until it's running. Compressors on, fans on, all that stuff, right? So when you're measuring voltage, if you can, measure it. Again, if you're doing a safety test, you do it when it's off just to make sure that you're safe. But as far as seeing, do I have the proper voltage, you wanna do that under load. You wanna do it with it on. Make sense? Okay, so that's voltage. Current, do I have to measure it with the system on or off? Quick, quick, uh, quick check to make sure we're all awake with it on, right? Because it's not gonna do anything unless it's on. Not just voltage applied, but actually doing something. Some voltage applied to whatever the load is, whatever work we're supposed to do. So if I measure a current and I say, oh my, that current is higher than it should be. You don't have to say, oh my, like that if you don't want. It's fine if you do. You sound like a grandma. <laughs> oh heavens, heavens to Betsy. Um, and you measure a current that's too high, what is the reason why that current is too high? If the voltage is what it's supposed to be which it generally is. Less resistance, bam, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. That means you have less resistance, all right? If I have a motor or a compressor or something like that and the windings are damaged and one of those windings are touching the wall of the inside of that compressor or touching some other metal part inside that compressor, what's gonna happen to the resistance to the flow? It's gonna drop, why? Because you're making another path. You're making a, you, could you say that the path that you're making is shorter? <laughs> huh? Uh, he laughed way too hard at that. It wasn't that funny of a joke, but it's fine. I appreciate that. Yes, the path is shorter, which is what we call that. We call it a short, right? And when you have too much resistance, what do we call that? We call that a long. No, we don't. <laughs> I just made that up. No, so you have resistance that's too low, right? You have current or... Uh, a voltage applied across a path that is undesigned. It's going somewhere else other than where it's supposed to be going, which in turn is reducing the resistance. All right, let's talk about vehicles. So I've got, I've got a highway and it's a really crappy highway, right? It's, it's all it's nasty and it's jacked up and I've got a bunch of cars that are supposed to move down this highway. Are, they gonna, is, are a lot of them gonna be able to move or are, gonna, are they gonna move slowly? They're gonna move slower, right? Now what happens if I have this so now that means that my current in this case is low, right? My resistance is high, it's a jacked up road, not very many cars, again, these are just metaphors. The electrical engineers are gonna be like, you're teaching this all wrong, you need to start with math. Sorry, we don't do that much math here. But understanding the basics will help us. So you got this jacked up road, that means the current's gonna be low, right? Now what happens if I build this super highway right beside it and people can get off of this crappy little road and they can take this super wide, highway and travel down it. What's gonna to happen to the overall amount of cars that can move? It's gonna go up, right? And what do we call it when two things are running side by side? What do we call that? Parallel, parallel right? Have you ever heard of this with electricity? You got a parallel circuit, right? And if one of these parallel circuits is a path that's very low resistance, and the other one is a path that's very high resistance, which one is gonna move more cars? Which one? Yeah, lower resistance, right? The super highway. Now, does that mean that zero cars are gonna take the crappy road? Some cars will take the crappy road, but very few. Just the really dumb drivers are gonna take the crappy road. So when people say electricity takes the path of least resistance, have anybody ever heard that before? Yes. Electricity takes the path of least resistance? What they mean by that is, is that more, electric, more electrons move down the path of lower resistance. So which one has more current? The crappy road or the big superhighway? Big, big superhighway, right? And when you have a short, a shorter path, an easier path, think of a short as an easier path. Lower resistance means easier. So the electrons, rather than moving through this big winding of copper, it can just go to the casing. It can take a shorter path. What's that shorter path gonna do to our current? 
it's going to increase it, right? And the lower the resistance, the higher that current's going to go. If you start doing some math, you'll see that with really low resistance paths, like a wire touching metal back to ground, that current can be massively high, right? Super high current. And that's what happens when you have a shorted compressor and you notice that breaker trips almost instantaneously. You have that 40 amp, 50 amp breaker and bam, it's just tripping like that super quick because that current could be 200, 300 amps, 400, 500 amps in some cases, depending on how low resistance that other parallel path is. That doesn't mean that the main path is broken. It just means that you're giving it another low resistance path. And that other low resistance path is where the majority of those cars are gonna drive, where the majority of that current's gonna happen. Make sense? So there's a lot of reasons this can occur. Now, another thing that I wanna make sure that we hammer down pretty quickly is, let's say that we've got a thermostat, okay? And we're just gonna, we're gonna make this really simple. So in a thermostat, we've got R that comes into the thermostat and Y that goes out of the thermostat to energize our contactor, right? So R is the path in, and when we say in and out, it's alternating current, so it's all going back and forth. But in our heads, we like to think in and out, right? So we've got power going into R, and then we go out of Y, and we go to this contactor coil. And a contactor coil looks something like this, right? And it closes a set of contacts that are drawn like this, which is actually weird, because the same symbol used for contacts is also the symbol that most people use for capacitors, which is confusing, but that's, uh, this always comes up. And so then on the other side here, we go back, and it connects to C, common, right? If I take my amp clamp, and let's say that this contactor coil is, you know, it's pulling in, so it's gonna be used, there's gonna be some current, right? So the switch is closed in the thermostat, and actually we'll go ahead and draw the proper symbol for this. So in order for it to call for cooling, it's going to make on a rise in temperature, and this is the symbol for a thermal switch. So if you were gonna draw that on a diagram, that's what that would look like. When this switch closes, it closes the path so the electrons can move through this coil, right? And let's say I measure here and I'm measuring 0.1 amps. Okay, makes sense? What am I gonna measure here? If I measure 0.1 amps here, what am I gonna measure here? 0.1 amps, what am I gonna measure here? Right, what am I gonna measure here? 0.1 amps, right? The current is the same throughout the entire circuit because where else would it go, right? Unless there's like some other circuit coming in somewhere, the current's gonna be the same everywhere in that circuit at every point in the circuit, right? So now let's say that there's something messed up. Let's say this contactor isn't pulling in properly. And this is a little secret sauce. If a contactor doesn't pull in, if it gets stuck open, the current it draws is higher because there's actually this little metal shaft that pulls into the electromagnetic portion of that coil. And if that metal shaft doesn't pull in, the current stays really high. It's like taking a motor and holding it still. You know how if you take a motor, it's lock rotor, we talked about this, that motor draws higher current. Same thing if a relay or a contactor gets jammed open. It doesn't happen very often, but it can happen, especially if it's like full of bugs or something. Let's say that happens and now, this circuit that's supposed to draw very low current is now drawing one amp or something like that. We'll say one amp. One amp here, one amp here, one amp here, one amp here, right? You get that? But here's the other trick. If there's one amp in all those places, there's also one amp here inside the thermostat switch. Have you ever seen a thermostat that's like weirdly showing a really high temperature? Like just, it, it just does this and it does it in certain modes and maybe not others. The thermostat temperature will just start rising. Now, a lot of times it's because there's a gap in the wall and there's a hole and the heat's coming down the wall and getting into the thermostat, that can happen. Or sometimes it's, you know, light shining on it or whatever other thing. Dogs parking himself right underneath the thermostat, who knows, something else. But in a lot of cases, this can happen when one of the low voltage loads or one of the low voltage circuits are drawing higher current than they should. Because when there's higher current, there's also more heat everywhere, right? Uh, when a wire melts, why does that wire melt? It got too hot. And why did it get too hot? High current, right? If you have an undersized wire, it's got too much current moving through it, or you've got some load, something in the system that's drawing too high a current. When you see melted stuff, melted circuits, melted electrical, there's usually two reasons for it. One, it was drawing high current, or two, there was a bad connection. Or I guess three, maybe it was undersized to begin with, improper conductor, whatever. All right, so you always gotta figure out the cause of that. But the point is, is that if there's high current all these places, there's also high current inside that thermostat, which is producing what? Heat. Right? That thermostat's going to get hot. Now, is, can it happen sometimes because internal to the thermostat, there's a poor connection? Maybe one of those contacts is failing. There's different types of electronic switches inside thermostats, but that can happen.
But in a lot of cases that happens because there was something downstream that caused it to fail. Reversing valve solenoid coil is drawing too much current. Another quick tip, if you take a reversing valve solenoid, everybody know what I'm talking about, the electromagnet that sits on a reversing valve? And you take that and you unhook it from the reversing valve and you power it up. Do you know what happens to that coil? It, it's a magnet, but it gets real hot and then it either melts or trips the, uh, blows the fuse, whatever. But keep in mind that fuse is a five amp fuse. That's a lot of current before it's actually gonna trip. In many cases, it's gonna either melt the wire or it's gonna melt the solenoid. Why does it do that? Because that solenoid is designed to induce into that rod in the reversing valve. If it's disconnected and you energize it, this is true of all solenoids, you're gonna ruin it. Ask Gavin about the time that we had the solenoid connected to the water heater. Uh, that was designed to shut it off so that way he wouldn't take like hour long showers and he thought he was going to be cute and he just disconnected it off of the he could just unplug it from the wall he didn't do that he disconnected it from the solenoid and then it caught on fire and all that kind of stuff and that's why that happens because if you disconnect a solenoid and it's energized that electromagnet can no longer induce into that metal core and it overheats but it doesn't just necessarily damage this part it could also damage everything down the line because the current is the same everywhere in the circuit. That's the point that I want to get to here to help you understand. It's the same everywhere. If you're measuring current on a compressor and you measure it on common at the contactor or common down the other side, it's going to be the same on that common. Anywhere you measure it, that, that current's going to be the same. As a final tip when measuring current, you do want to make sure that you're centering it in the jaws. And a lot of the kind of modern meters are going to have a little line, a little dash here that's going to show you where to put that conductor in the jaws because if you get it out of position, it can measure a little bit different. Better quality meter, the less it tends to matter, but you will see that. Another thing is, when you are measuring current, you wanna to try to isolate that conductor as much as possible, because if you're in there where there's a lot of other conductors that are also drawing current, that can affect the measurement. You wanna to try to get it a little bit away from the other conductors, otherwise you tend to read high. Be very careful about saying that uh, for example, a condenser fan motor, you'll see this. Condenser fan motors nowadays draw very low current. You'll see them where they're rated at 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 amps nowadays. And if you're measuring there and it's in around the compressor, you'll be like, oh man, it's measuring 0 0.8, this motor's bad. And then you pull the wire out away and you center it in the jaws and ooh, actually it's lower than that. And that can also be due to the fact that it's a lot of these meters just aren't that good at that range. So they'll tend to measure high. So just be very careful. Don't just take a single measure and be like, the motor's bad. It's not that simple. In fact, Generally speaking, thermal imaging is probably one of the best ways to know if a condenser fan motor is failing because of it overheating, but that's a whole other story. All right, any questions about that? Current's the same on the same conductor everywhere in the circuit. Higher resistance means lower current, Hi lower resistance. I, I did the opposite with my hands there. Lower resistance means higher current, higher resistance means lower current. So when you see high current, it's because the resistance is too low or there's another parallel path that the electricity can follow, those electrons can follow, that's of lower resistance. That's it. Have a wonderful week. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.